Welcome to Super Connected. With me, Tim Arnold, and my special guests. We invite you to join us in an intimate and honest exploration into the theme of connection. What it means to be connected to each other, what it means to be connected to ourselves, and what it means to connect in an ever-changing world. And welcome to another episode of Super Connected. And today, my special guest is somebody that I've had the great pleasure and privilege of working with. A um, little bit like working with your hero when you've grown up listening and watching somebody's work, wondering how they did it, how they came up with the ideas they came up with, and then suddenly you find yourself working with that person. So... Um, uh, it's a, a maverick, a maverick genius of uh, vision and sound, video artist, video director, musician, singer, all round, um, un, un, uncategorized kind of talent, Mr. Kevin Godley. Hello, Kevin. How are you? I, th I think you must have the wrong number. <laughs> I'm sorry if I got through to that the Chinese laundry again. Yeah, I think you probably have. That's a that's a that's a very kind introduction. Well, um, I mean it's it's true as well though. I um you're you're you you are sort of very difficult to categorize which makes you um you know a real a real artist. It, there's not a there's not a standard way to, to sort of describe what you do. How, how would you describe what you do for any of the um, uh, impoverished listeners who do not know about your work? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, a, a difficult question to answer. I, I suppose I, I try and touch on lots of different aspects of the creative process, which, which, which sounds a bit pretentious. But it, really it boils down to... Uh, things in sound and things in pictures if you want to distill it that far mm. uh, there are, but I'm prepared to look at other things as well I'm also interested in, in yeah. video games and in writing and in, in, in this that and the other it's but it, it's the creative process that that has driven me just to make things, yeah. I guess. Just to contextualise, uh, I'm not going to take it for granted that um, uh, everybody knows uh, your work like I do. Um, I, let's talk about just a couple of the things that um, you're known for, I suppose, c commercially speaking. Yeah. If I throw out a couple of words like 10cc, U2, Band-Aid, um, how, how do you sort of see those... Um, points in in your life in your career they're, they're they're pretty important aren't they they are they're, they're kind of high watermarks they're, 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 they're moments where what i did uh i think was was kind of top of the range of of my canon and 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 there were also points where i i discovered things that i could do that i didn't know that i could do before you started because in art college didn't you you began you you went to art yeah college. Many many years ago, I spent as I think eight years in art college, which which was insane, and I I kept jumping from one course to another because I didn't really want to jump into the real world at all. I was having a lot of fun at art college, and um, I didn't actually learn much, but I had a great time. I, I learned how to dance, how to do my hair, what trousers to wear, and how to smoke dope. Were you at and drink? <laughs> Were you at um, art college in that magical period that people like uh, you know Ray Davis and um, and Pete Townsend were? Was it, yeah. was it the sort of beginning of the sixties? Is that about? yeah yeah? Uh, it, it, it was a great it was a great place to be. It, it it was at the forefront of of that sense of rebellion of the of the nineteen sixties. There were so many ideas and so many people who came out of that period. It, it, being in art school, who went on to be be very influential in the in the creative world since then, and and the atmosphere there was 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 tremendous. It was very open and very 
and very experimental. We felt we were kind of the vanguard of the future of, of art, in inverted commas, if you like. Am I right in thinking that the, the, the sort of periods of time uh, that you were in art school was a time when some people were getting to go to uh, secondary education and universities and art college who hadn't previously been able to or been afforded the opportunity? Is that right? It was a sort of boom, wasn't it, at the beginning of the 60s? There was a boom, and I, and I consider myself very lucky to to have, have been in the right place at the right time. Um, yes, I mean, did you grow up thinking, I'm definitely going to university? Was that something that was no. always on the card? No, I grew up thinking, basically, how to avoid doing anything, because <laughs> I was... Uh, I wasn't a, I wasn't a, a clever child. I was I was very lazy, and I, I didn't have any targets. I didn't have any sense of what I wanted to be when I grew up. Particularly, I think like mm. most kids of my generation who grew up in Manchester in the in the fifties, nineteen fifties, it was a pretty grey place to be, and who you were and who you were going to be was pretty much dictated to by who your parents were so I was about to become a shopkeeper for want of a better uh, word wow um, I cannot imagine mom, that <laughs> well no I, I, I can't either but, but it's very strange how time plays tricks because my dad had a series of shops that were quite successful in the centre of Manchester um, selling radios TVs record players and musical instruments and cameras and I didn't want to go into that business at all but if you look at all the things he sold and compare them to the things that I've subsequently did I, I was involved with all of those things yeah. so I kind of went into the family business but from a different angle yeah from a different perspective and yeah. and so through that um 60s period but where, where was the um that, that that moment where you knew you were heading into the music industry uh, there wasn't really at least not not for a, a good while the only thing in the early days the only thing that i could do was draw um and i did that quite well and that was my savior in a way i used to spend a good deal of time outside drawing things going into the local park and drawing things and what I found was that people would stop and pause and look at what I was doing and praise it and oh I can actually do something rather well and I became addicted to that both the process of doing it and being praised for it so it became a natural extension of what I wanted to do and it was really the only thing that I was good at so which point uh, during during the 60s did you suddenly feel that you know um it was um a time to enter into the music industry did, 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 when when did that happen how did that happen well it was it was kind of slow and it was very amateurish but it, it was you know uh, i i i like listening to music as most of my little clan did at the time and we all like music and uh, it was at a point where rock and roll was sneaking in. And so, you know, we decided to form a, a little band, and we did. A group of us thought we might be able to play instruments, so we formed a little band called Group 17. And I, I don't ask me where that name came from. It's a great no name. Idea. <laughs> no idea. I mean, you know, maybe one of us lived at number 17 something, or maybe one of us was almost 17. Don't know. Um, but we formed a little band and we were pretty crap. We, and we played local parties and dances and stuff like that. And we, and we you know... Were you, were you playing us... drums at that point? No, I wasn't. Oh, right. I was, I, was, I was playing bass guitar on a six-string Hofner Club 50, um, right. which I borrowed from my dad's music shop. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so thank you, Dad got me started in the music business the, the, but I was terrible and we used to do we used to do covers of Shadows tunes and the Shadows if no one knows who they were were, were the band that used to back Cliff Richard yeah. if they can remember who Cliff so Richard is so we're talking is. kind of late uh, well sorry mid 60s yeah exactly yeah. and they used to do dance steps very simple dance steps while they played so naturally if we were kind of copying yeah, the them, formation we, dance we, with, the, with the sort yes. of backwards and forwards side to side yeah very simple things which is you know 
so he kind of did it, but I was hopeless. I was hopeless at bass guitar, absolutely rubbish. Um, but my next door neighbor got a set of drums. Uh, his father bought him a set of drums. And so uh, I, I, I think he, he joined the band on drums, but you know, I'm sorry, Jeff, to say this, but as you know, you, you, you were a terrible drummer. He, he, <laughs> he didn't have that sort of, that sort of natural sort of coordination one needs to to play a drum set properly or at all and so i w- i would just go in and marvel at this beautiful piece of equipment and, and eventually eventually i got to sit down behind the kit and try it and even though i couldn't play properly i learned pretty quickly that i had i had the relevant systems to be able to learn how to play better because, you know, I realised that as most most people think that, that drummers are actually playing four different things at the same time, but yeah. they're not. They're actually playing four elements of the same thing at the same time. So that made sense to my body and it came pretty quickly, so I became a drummer. Yeah, and, and I really want to hear about your experience as a musician uh, on the song I'm Not In Love. So... Th- as um, those who have heard the show before, they'll know that this is a, about connections and how certain things are connected in our lives. And my connection to you, Kevin, is, of course, that that song, which you created with your band, was number one when I was being born. <laughs> so it's a very special <laughs> song to me. Um, I mean, that's uh, I don't even know if you were playing drums on that, were you? Not drums so much. Uh, it was a, it was a Moog synthesizer, uh, um, because we recorded the basic backing track in the control room of the studio as opposed to in the live area, and uh, couldn't get a kit into the control room. <laughs> we did it so we could isolate all the different sounds. So I was just playing a bass drum sound uh, with one key on a synthesizer. Yeah, the story which is famous by now about that um song and the vocals that were such a huge um innovation i suppose at the time uh, uh did, did it feel like that did it feel like you were creating something that was possibly you know prophesying the beginnings of like massive multi-track recording and um the possibilities that aren't today are endless which of course in 1975 they weren't though you still had limitations which you were challenging did it feel like you were doing that or was it just a happy rock and roll accident no no it, it, well it, uh, first of all the, the song itself had already been recorded but but we didn't like the results it sounded a bit shit and so we kind of shelved it and carried on recording but we we knew we were going to come back to it at some point, and we were kind of looking for a way, a new way to approach it. So um, it was that time, and I think I, I think what happened was this: I, I suggested, probably out of desperation rather than imagination, I said, "Okay, well, why don't we try doing the whole thing with with voices, lots and lots and lots and lots of voices." Um, a little bit like the sound that was on the on the soundtrack of uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, that mysterious, angelic, almost scary vocal sound. It, it was it was a very atmospheric thing. So I, the song was always lovely, but it was it, it needed a different kind of canvas to exist on. So I, you know, I I kind of said that, and everyone went, "Yeah, how the hell do we do it?" You know, because back then everything was was there was no there were no there were no techniques there was no technology in order to accomplish that. Um, today you'd probably yes. sample the actual sound from the film and and use that, but we had to start from scratch, which meant singing lots. Um, and and I think it was Lol that came up with the idea of doing it as a series of of tape loops. Lol cream. Yes, Low Cream, uh, uh, w- which we proceeded to do. It it took a long, long time to do, and it was quite difficult to do, because in order for the for the loops to last the relevant amount of time without you hearing a click where the beginning joins to the end, 
they had to be long loops. So so we would sing, we would all gather around a microphone and sing a note, create a loop, and then play that loop back onto the multi-track recorder. Mm -hmm. uh, but in order to do that, we had people standing, you know, about 10 yards away from the, the tape machine with yeah. pencils and screwdrivers and... <laughs> so the loop could loop could go around it. It was it was it was quite difficult, but it was it was fun to do. But it it wasn't until I don't know maybe halfway through this process that yeah. we began to hear something that made any kind of sense. It was we were just kind of floating around in the dark. I mean, this is like this is. Like, this is kind of ear porn for me. I, I just any anything from the <laughs> from the seventies of um, you know um, masters like yourself talking about how you recorded certain sounds that I've grown up with is just wonderful. It's, it, it, I'm imagining um, you know people well with reams. There of was tape. nothing else you could do. I mean, it's like you know you, you exist in the time you exist in. Yeah. I mean, we, there were no mobile phones. There was no there was no internet. So you know you, you didn't even know. What else to do? So you just you just found a way of, I mean, of doing it. The, the song, I mean, it's often on radio, and it's so, it does start with the um, with the massive, with epic uh, sound of all your vocals. It, that's the first thing you hear, and it, um, it, it it's very dreamlike and it's very otherworldly, and it's so, um, it's just an, it's a signature. As soon as you hear it, when was when was the first time that you and the rest of the band? I mean, when Ten CC realized we've made a classic i mean it, it must have happened at a particular moment and you, you got a feeling of it, it, wow it did well it was a mess for a while or what we were doing thinking back we were we were turning the 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 recording console into a musical instrument because what we ended up with on i think it was it was 22 tracks of the that must have been 20 tracks of the 24 track tape recorder each of those tracks were loaded with a chord that was made up of these vocal loops that we'd been creating. So what ended up happening was that we'd each sit at the desk and we were given a bunch of faders. And at a certain point, I would fade up these faders, which made that chord happen. And then Lol would fade up another chord to join it, and Eric would fade up another and crank. So all four of us were playing the desk like a sort of like a musical instrument. Yes. And once we started, the the backing track which we pre-recorded was also on the other track. So we were listening and adding this. There was a guide vocal there as well. And as soon as we started going through this process, something magical. And it's a real band, isn't it? I mean, it's it's not just a band uh, playing instruments together and connecting through music. You've actually turned yourself into uh, an instrument by m melding yourselves to the studio console, really. Well, the connection was de the connection was deeper. You did it. You got it. That was it. Move on. You have to. It, what the original process did was it gave you confidence that what you were doing was worked, and once you were convinced that it had worked, you recorded it. There was no sort of okay, well we'll just we'll do that for now and we'll go back and tinker with it later if it's not right. That really wasn't possible. Uh, pretty much in both mediums, both in in editing f pictures, and also editing sound, you you couldn't do that without a lot of messing around and a lot of time wasted. So you had to make decisions and you had to stick with them. And of course the big, the big difference between uh, recording music in the 70s uh, and through until the 90s, I think, um, and now is that uh, now we always pretty much look at a screen, don't we? Like, you know, like we have, yeah. And um, and those days, I guess you 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 didn't have a screen when you were doing. I'm not in love. There wasn't a screen, was there? No, we didn't. We didn't. All we had was uh, whether it sounded any good. Yeah. There were, meet, there, were meet, there were meters to say whether we were overloading the signal. That was it. My experience uh, of that was very short. I, I think my first album was in the '90s. There was a little computer in the corner of the room but nobody ever wanted to look at it <laughs> it was an alien being in the room but ever since it's always been looking and looking and looking 
looking at the music you're making. Yeah, well, it's back to the question of technology again, to a degree. The way the way music is made these days um, is so different to the way it was made then. I mean, there are huge advantages because you can now do things that you couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. But it, it's possible to lose a number of aspects of the of the process. So it's very easy with a computer at home or a laptop to create a backing track. But the problem, and it's probably not a problem, but, but I've noticed that one thing that you do you lose in the process, you lose the, a sense of place. When I, was, uh, when I was making records back in the day, there was always a sense that this record was made in Detroit, this record was made in Los Angeles, this record was made in Abbey Road, because each of those rooms and each of those studios had their own audio characteristics and they, they were yes. self-evident in the recordings themselves. They had character. Now that has been replaced by a sense of perfection and a sense of polish and the fact that you can manipulate sounds to the nth degree, mm. which e is equally interesting, it's just completely different. Just working from a technological starting point can prove problematic if you appreciate things like the God-given mistake. That's, that's harder to come by these days if something is programmed. It's difficult to fuck it up yeah. so that something happens that you're not expecting. Have, we, have, we, have either of us used that yet? The God-given mistake. Oh, well, we used to often. We no, I mean, is often... It, it's a title, isn't it? Have, we, have, have you used that yet? What, the, the God-given mistake? I haven't. I think I borrowed it from somebody else, though. Yeah. It, it, it simply means things happen. Well, you've, got, you've, got the, you... you've got the God in your name, so you should use that. For <laughs> I'm allowed, yeah. I'm <laughs> it's, allowed. It's a good title. Um, I mean, it, it still happens vocally. You know, when you're singing something, you sing something wrong, but it's actually better than what you were intending to sing. So it's, it's, it's still there. It's still possible. It's yes. just all the other aspects of, that allows you to create the sound that you couldn't create before in it by any other means. That's, that's difficult to screw up. So if you're into that way of thinking, yeah. you have to screw it up. You I had to, to relearn that. To screw it up, yeah. I had to relearn it. I went through more years than I, I would, should have done trying to make things exactly as I thought they were meant to be. Um, and then I rediscovered the, the mistake that you, that you listen yeah. back to and think, there's something brilliant about this section of the song, but, um, but that bit's really wrong. But if you take the bit that's really wrong out, the rest of the song doesn't it's sound as good anymore. <laughs> No, it's kind of no. It, you it have to because yeah. making music is, is is an instinctive thing. So you have to hang on to, you have to hang on to that aspect of it for grim death. Yeah. If you just lose that to a series of programs and samples, then do you think it affects connection? Just our, you know, the the love that b b pretty much all humans have for music. It's it's. It, it, it resonates deeply with everybody in one way or another. Do you think the, you know, the, the technology um, created music is missing anything that, that was why the uh, industry got a chance to begin in the first place? Um, at it's the end, a, end of the it's 50s. It's a pointless and the question. It's a pointless question because. Regardless of what either of us think about it, it, it's what is. And the fact of the matter is that, that with so any it's a, advance... So it's an evolution then? You think, that you think we're in just a constant flow of ev evolution? Yeah, I do, because in, in any advance, particularly in technology, it probably gives as much as it takes away. Um, it just changes things. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really all down to a matter of pers personal taste with, with music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what technology has allowed us to do, it's allowed us to experiment quicker. It's allowed us to disseminate the music quicker to a lot more people mm. quicker. It's allowed a lot more people to listen to music. Yeah. What we're, what we're, really, what we're, really, we're, we're really talking about is, is one's individual taste in music, which is a whole different discussion. Sure. But the, the the tools are there 
however way you look at them, even from the most primitive tools to the most technologically advanced tools, they are there to make whatever music you want to make. And you can deploy any of those tools to your own advantage. You don't have to play by the rules. I've probably been a bit greedy because it's you asking you about music. But of course, you know, your talents and uh, experience as a visual artist um, are fascinating and have blown my mind when we've had the chance to work together and and just in talking about it I've learned a lot from your perspective on in the terms of how we see things these days on screens and uh, I mean we've on on my next project we we did a lot of talking backwards and forwards about the um, the concept of screen addiction and and, <laughs> and what you called yeah. eye candy a lot of the time yeah uh, um and that was a couple of years ago we were talking about that and things have moved on even further now you know where people are you know using oculus heads and all that kind of stuff um there's a hell of a lot of life that's being lived um through looking at screens or or uh, an, an an altered reality um hmm. well, how do you feel about it as somebody that pioneered um a lot of the well, certainly with the music videos that you made in the 80s you pioneered the way we were receiving image you know how quickly uh, and what quality and of course in your case um conceptually as an artist what do you feel about the way it's we're so screen heavy now well i th i think i think i think the problem is i mean i i part of me loves it because um it means that if if I want to make anything of a visual nature, there are numerous ways of doing it and numerous ways of thinking about it um, and realizing it. But but on the other side, it it means that we are spoiled to death by the amount of entertainment, be it be it visual entertainment and audio entertainment. We're we're bombarded with every single day, twenty four seven, and it's it's like i don't know when i when i started making things for want of a better expression l less was more uh, and then there was a period of time probably in the 90s and early 2000s where more was more and now it feels like <laughs> more a little is bit too much that more is less <laughs> yeah <laughs> because there's so much stuff out there and it's not really for me to judge or pass judgment on things but there's so much crap out there as well mm. it's like you know it's like now anyone can go make a film which is fantastic but what that really means is there'll be there'll be a lot of crap films out there um so it's 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 a tricky balancing act between what you can do and what is actually done. Yes. Uh, in a sense, it it was you know if you if you were a consumer for want of a better phrase, there has to be one because that's horrible. People who listened or watched, there were you know where you went to listen or watch was relatively limited, and what you got was relatively limited, so you could choose mm. the best or whatever suited your taste. Now you are, you can't move for stuff. Mm. You can't move for it. And what has seemingly happened is that the attention spans have wilted over the years. So if I don't like this, mm. oh, I'll, I'll press that button and listen to this. Don't like that either. I'll watch that instead, that shit. I'll watch this, don't like that. So we are spoiled to death. We're, we're being entertained to death. I mean, that sounds, like. when you describe it like that, it sounds like another version of um, uh, not allowing the God-given mistake. Well, yeah, well, I, maybe. It's, it's well, you it's know, because like, I don't like this, so I'm turning it off, I'm going to try that. And you, and you keep going until something feels... Right, which and, and it's described quite often as um, being in your own filter bubble, isn't it? Because you're able to s keep swiping until you find the date that you want, or swiping until you find the song you want to hear, or the it's Netflix show that you want to watch. Interestingly, when when Ten C was 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 popular in England, and we used to do Top of the Pops quite often, 
uh, we we got to understand how they how they'd made decisions about what to put on the show, regardless yeah. of what it was, you know, a hit or not. What they used to do, and also the same for radio, they used to put a, a single on the turntable, play it. If it didn't grab them in the first ten seconds, it was thrown off. Mm. And I think that's what's happening across the board now. If it doesn't grab you in the first ten seconds, <laughs> so it sounds like. Um you know, the general public have all become uh, the, the the gatekeepers that the, I don't know, the radio stations and the record companies used to be. Kind of. And there, Is there something quite degree, cool about that, though? Dicta- they seem to be dictating, probably more because of social media than anything else, Is in, in the, their opinions are now far more visible than they yeah. used to be, uh, not just only in entertainment but in everything. We all felt that we were making something that may may or may not be valuable, but we were trying to make something that was mm. and that would be memorable in some way. Um, now it's just it's just part of the landscape. It's like it's like something that belongs on a supermarket shelf. It's a consumable mm. that you have on in your ears while you're doing something else, and then you put something else on. And that's because there are so many different ways to amuse yourself these days, as well as music. Whereas back in the day, there weren't. Music was claimed by a generation as their their totem, their mojo, their good luck charm, something that represented who mm. they were. Mm. That that doesn't really exist anymore. There aren't that many tribes anymore, youth tribes. There aren't. It's not as important as it was. It's just part of the entertainment landscape. Yeah, which is unfortunate, but just uh, but that's how it is. And going back to um, imagery and video and film uh, for a minute. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you did. You. I'm not sure what the correct way to credit you for it is, but designed or produced uh, the Zoo TV tour that you about two... conceived and directed. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> conceived and directed. You conceived and directed, which was Bono's and the band's vision, or was it your vision? I, I mean, it was a collaboration. It, it's interesting. They're they're an interesting case because they are very, they're very hands on in the in, in the music video process, um, but it, it, and sometimes the, sometimes the ideas came out of a discussion about the feeling of of what the track was trying to impart. But I would always go away and go and sort of come up with a bunch of ideas, and we'd sit around and chuck them around, and we'd we'd find out which element worked and which didn't. I, mm. The original idea for, I'm just trying to remember, we didn't nail the original idea for NOM um, until we all had dinner. I think it was in Are Germany you talking about the something. music video for NUM or what yes, you did on the stage video, show? The, the, okay. the track had already existed and we were, they wanted me to do the video. So mm. we had a sort of dinner meeting, uh, as I recall, and we were just throwing ideas around and we eventually came up with this because we were we were kind of due to shoot in a couple of days and we didn't have an idea we had a crew standing by in a studio <laughs> i'm remembering that this is the edge straight to camera with lots of people doing things to his face is that right yeah yeah so it and this was shortly this was either during or shortly after zoo tv tour yeah um around about that time anyway um so this idea sort of just grew. So it came from a series of discussions rather than my, than my usual way of doing things, which is to spend time at home listening, write them down, share them with the band, and then we talk about it. Yeah. It was kind of the opposite. It was we all sat down and, and talked about it until it existed. And then my poor producer, Ned O'Hanlon, had to go out and find all these people and objects and yeah. make it a reality in the yeah. next couple of days. <laughs> Which we did, but you know things still happen on the set. There's a wonderful moment towards the end. It wasn't my idea where where Paul McGuinness comes and whispers something in Edge's ear. Yeah, one of the one of them had an idea about that, uh, and then I threw the idea of the actual DP having his picture taken with Edge um, towards the end of the video. Probably the first selfie, <laughs> but uh, so things you you. When you're doing videos, you have to leave room for things to happen. Again, it's not the God-given mistake. It's 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 the space allowed 
for things to be tried. I think I've gone a little off piece there. I don't think so at all. I think it's the the space is something that's come up a few times in these shows um, that there isn't enough of it. I mean that that song numb from my interpretation of it uh, is quite prophetic. It, it's it's and and the video expresses that beautifully. It's it's it is a little bit to do with how much information is coming at us, uh, yeah. and it does make you numb. Um, yeah, which holds. Just as much. And that was in when? Nine- today as it did then. Was that 90, 92, 93 maybe? Something, something, something like, like that. that. And yeah. that's, I mean, that's then. That was Bono sort of, um, I mean, I'm guessing Bono wrote the lyrics for that. And it was a, it was a busy time. But it's nothing compared to how, how busy information is today. No. It's, uh, it's dangerous the amount of information and the amount of misinformation and what, how you differentiate between them is... Uh... I have to ask you, because, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a current thing. What do you think about the deep fake stuff that's happening? You know, where, where uh, the, uh, just in case nobody knows what it is, it's when you have... Uh, uh, you put other people... You, put, you have a video of a person and you can put somebody else's face on them and it's and it's done so well that you wouldn't be able to tell it's fake i think that's the yeah. best way to describe it, isn't it that's right that it's, must have been uh, that must have been something in your mind at, at different points i mean even when you did the cry video the godly and cream song yeah. uh you were morphing face after face in that this this deep fake technology must have been somewhere in the godly imagination a long time ago well one thing that was in our imagination probably way way before then was that was the notion that at some point in time you would be able to recreate artists that existed and have now since died and use them again for instance you'd be able to release a new elvis presley album and make a film starring Elvis Presley and you'd be able to have Marlon Brando in your new film as opposed to watching him in an old film. Uh, we were, we thought it was crazy, but we thought it would one day be possible to do that. And that's definitely in this area. I think my, I think I'm glad I'm getting on a bit. Because <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure how this will all pan out it's just it's, it just seems to be another example of what flawed creatures human beings are that we have in fact failed as a species and that uh, if it all turn if it all turns to shit for us at some point in the near future we probably deserve it it you're reminding me of something i saw in uh, a magazine earlier that said uh, are human beings qualified to be good gardeners it was obviously to do with climate change. And, <laughs> we're uh, rubbish. We're absolute rubbish. We've, well, we've I, know, I know a few gardeners. Cock are pretty, pretty of good everything, gardeners, everything. But. And you, you know, uh, I suppose the advantage of of being at this ripe old age is to look around you and and and, and see it, and it being incredibly obvious. Mm. That notion of um, of us being flawed. I mean, it, it's funny, isn't it? It's as upsetting in. Uh, the wider world as it is wonderful in art where all the mistakes are beautiful to watch or listen to yeah yeah it's it's just such a it's a strange time to be alive it's exciting in many ways you're to... the third person that said that to me today um maybe it's a nice way to to uh, conclude uh this lovely session with you kevin um why is it such a strange time to be alive because it, it seems to be contradictory at, at, at every level. Um, up until recently, what facts seem to be facts and what was said, if you believed in what was said, seemed to make sense. Now, yeah. nothing, nothing seems to be black or white anymore. Everything seems to be various shades of grey. And you're never really true if what is said is is correct or whether there is a hidden meaning or there is there an agenda um so and everything everybody is watching everybody else at the same time and there are things you can say and can't say and it's just preposterously confusing 
not just to me, I, th I think to anybody pretty much living in this time, it's, it's difficult to cut a clear path through everything and, and, and understand what needs to be done. I understand what you're saying and I, I sort of feel um, similar, um, but I also have a lot of hope that um, extremely young people are working this out in a way that uh, will inspire them to make the changes that perhaps we're, we're not able to see at the moment. Do you feel that? It's sometimes we're just going through a, 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 a hazy bit where our my generation or and your generation are sort of looking out and not being able to focus well, comfortably. I think, I think the problem is that the, that the tools we create to help us do things are far, are far more advanced than we are. And mm -hmm. we don't quite know, quite know how to deploy them correctly. We create things that can do things, um, but they can probably do a lot more and do bad things as well as good things. So, and we haven't really learned as a species how to tame them and how to use them constructively and to, as a species, create a path, path forward that is going to be beneficial to humanity. Uh, there are still everybody, every tribe, every country, every religion, every race is still doing things that relate to them um, first. Um, and not, as far as I can see in every case, thinking of everybody else because we are. We are all connected, just to go back to your original theme. And that isn't something that is dominant but should be and, and is becoming more obvious every single day but seems to be moving further away from us not getting closer that's beautiful um thank you so much uh for for joining me and um and sharing what you've shared uh it's uh it's always fun to talk to you kevin um it's a pleasure Hi, who are you again <laughs> Don't worry about that. <laughs> um, no, really, really great. And, and that's, yeah, that it is to do with connection. And um, we should just have to wish upon a star that uh, we, we start using all these. It's a bit like you. what you were talking about before was a bit like a, there's a new Frankenstein story every week with the things that we keep coming up with. And, of course, yeah. they go walk about in the middle of the night and yeah, <laughs> attacked half the village and run right. off with it. We do have the tools to make things better, but yeah. we seem to glory. What, what humanity seems to be best at is fucking things up. Well, let's, uh, let's drink to that. Yeah, <laughs> cheers. Thank you so <laughs> much, Mr. Kevin Godley. <laughs> <laughs>